Almighty God, what a wonderful week we've had so far. Thank God, all the preaching has been wonderful. I'm so grateful for all of you that took the effort and made the effort to come and be with us and the atmosphere of the Holy Ghost. I'm very grateful for your giving, joining together in uh, reaching the world through our finances. All those that couldn't be here with us, we do miss you, but I appreciate you participating online. And uh, we know that God is going to help us tonight on this final night. I'm gonna preach under two hours and then we're gonna plant churches, so <laughs> thank God. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter one. Associated Press had a news story some years back and it went like this, Glasgow, Kentucky, Leslie Puckett, after struggling to start his car, he lifted the hood and discovered that someone had stolen the motor. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> that is the story of many Christians. Even many pastors, they are, ex they are experiencing frustrations and inabilities because they are discovering something vital is missing from their lives, their ministries, or their Christian experience, and that is the engine of the Holy Spirit. The text that we're going to read, Jesus is lining out his followers for what is going to determine the future of their lives and the work of God and in the text we're going to read, he gives three simple commands that we're going to look at. First, get the power. Second, witness. And third, spread the fire. Bow your heads. <laughs> read with me in Acts chapter 1. I want to preach about witnesses of fire on the final night of conference. Acts 1, starting at verse 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Witnesses and, and fire, or witnesses of fire. Let's begin, let's talk about fire and power. Jesus is preparing his followers for the task of reaching the world for God. Let's be honest, the task is huge. On this day, there were 11 apostles. They had, the Bible says, a maximum of 500 followers that were meeting, and he was expecting them to reach the entire world. That task is huge. Problems are enormous. You understand, if we're going to reach the world, there are economies that that is a struggle. There are cultural uh, uh, issues and pressures and blockages, political powers. For the last uh, uh, 10 or 11 months or so, we've battled uh, COVID and how that has had an effect. There are spiritual powers that blind and bind people and keep them from responding to the gospel. And Jesus is honest. As he's about to send them out, he is honest with them. What you have is not enough. Your talent, I, whatever you can do, you can sing, you, you have a whatever talent, it's not enough. Our programs, some of you are very proud of the programs that your church has, it is not enough. Some of you are very hard workers, it is not enough. The disciples discovered this, rowing the boat in the storm, and the Bible says they could not make it to land. Demon-possessed boy, what we could not cast out the demon. The Bible says in another place, they fished all night and they caught nothing. Those are simple pictures of, of what you and I face. 
And that should not be shocking because we will never be able to do a supernatural work with human power. If you're trying to do what is, must be a supernatural work, if you're doing that in your own power, you're going to be frustrated, discouraged, and unable to do what God called us to do. So Jesus, as he is sending them out, he says, this is where it begins. You have a supernatural need. You need supernatural power. Verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You know this word. You've heard it before. Dunamis in the Greek. We get our word dynamite. You need something explosive. Uh, the ability that is beyond you because it is supernatural. Verse 4 calls it the promise of the Father. And uh, uh, in, in this, uh, it is saying it is something planned by the Father. Some translations say what the Father has promised. Joel 2.28, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And our scripture says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus references back when John the Baptist was prophesying about his ministry. Think about this, Jesus who saves, Jesus who helps. But John says his major work, one of the major works of Jesus Christ is to to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So God is wanting by the power of the Holy Spirit to make supernatural power available to every believer everywhere at any time. And it's not an accident that he calls this a baptism. I want you to notice what he does not say. He does not say what you need is a misting. There are some folks, that's what they want. They would like a little spritz of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Vibo, Bibo. <laughs> that's enough. We don't want to get carried away with that. There are others that they want just a little bit of sprinkling. He says it is a baptism. This is a picture of, a, of dyeing cloth. If you were to take a, a white or a light colored cloth and you were to plunge it, that's the word, to drench it. It is absolutely soaked. Every fire, uh, fiber of that cloth that takes it on the dye. Jesus says that's what you need. You don't need a spritz. You don't need a mist or a sprinkling. You need every fiber of your being. You need your heart, your mind, your affections, your habits, your speech must be baptized with the fire of the Holy Holy Spirit. It's called a baptism of fire because fire is the symbol of the Holy Spirit. It is God at work. A Pentecostal, which is what we are, a Pentecostal believer is someone who believes in God at work doing something. Take a fire tour with me in the Bible. Fire in the burning bush was God entering into the human situation to deliver his people. Moses met that fire in the bush, a burning bush, and there was a calling and an equipping for destiny. With Elijah, the fire fell, and unbelieving people were convinced on the road to Emmaus, two disciples, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? The fire wasn't energizing. It caused a passion for the things of God. For the disciples, in the book of Acts, the fire transformed them from fear to boldness. It supernaturally enabled them to do God's will. The day of Pentecost, the fire fell and people were supernaturally attracted. Peter stood up. You can read the sermon. It is not a remarkable sermon, but he was on fire. And when he preached, 3,000 people were convinced and saved. And after the fire fell in the book of Acts, in a, these fire-empowered believers in a few short years, it was said that these men who have turned the world upside down 
Why? Because there was something supernatural at work. The fire of the Holy Spirit is God doing what we cannot do. The point that I want to make is in this scripture, this is an absolute priority. The world needed to be one. And I notice here that Jesus did not tell them, go and work. He said, go and wait. Don't even try to do this unless you have the Holy Ghost fire. Wait until you have the fire. There was a 10-day prayer meeting. Evidently, they were focused in prayer on getting this promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. My question to you tonight is, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? And as Pastor Campbell preached the other night, is there evidence? Don't tell me you have fire if there's no evidence of fire in your life. Is there evidence of fire in your ministry? Is there anything supernatural about your life? For some of you, did you used to have the fire? I'm not asking you, did you speak in tongues right after Noah got off the boat? That's great. I'm asking, do you have the fire today when we need it maybe more than ever? And we have to make the fire of the Holy Spirit our absolute priority. Listen, if you don't have that fire, you need to search the Word of God. Find what God promises and says about the power of the Holy Spirit. Believe it. Seek it in prayer. Contend in our services for a manifest presence. I don't want to tell people by faith that the Lord is here. I want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to see God convicting and saving and transforming and delivering healing and the gifts of the Spirit we need to pray in tongues publicly listen if you're ashamed of Pentecost then you're smarter than God we pray for new converts that's the desperate need our converts have got to get the Holy Spirit we've got to make room for the Holy Spirit and we've got to obey the Spirit, when He speaks, when we do that, God will do what we cannot do. John Wesley, it said that someone asked him how he was able to draw such large crowds, and reportedly he said, God lit me on fire, and people came to watch me burn. <laughs> Let's talk secondly about on-fire witnesses. Here's the problem. Modern Christianity has reduced the Holy Spirit to a feeling. You hear from time to time, Charisma Magazine will breathlessly tell us there's a new revival going on. But what they really mean by revival is people are going there and they're feeling something. I tingled. woo He's here. It was a thrill. Or they can tell you about an experience. I fell. I shook. I laughed. But the problem, it doesn't do anything when they leave. It is all about a feeling, and the next time Charisma announces a new revival, they'll travel there for a new feeling. But Jesus says the purpose of the power is ultimately, it's not even for us. It is to be a witness to other people. Acts 1.8, you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. A witness is one who bears record or tells what they have seen or they have heard. The power of the Holy Spirit produces witness to Jesus Christ, and that is primarily a verbal witness. It is evangelism, telling people who don't know about Jesus, telling them who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Acts twenty two fifteen. you'll be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. There's a logical basis. Why does God want us to be witnesses so bad? Because of human need. Right now, while we're here, there are people, listen, drugs are ravaging our nation. And no doubt, if you're from another nation, it no doubt is 
ravaging the nation. People are bound by alcohol and perversion. They're lonely and desperate and empty and suicidal. People are on their way to hell and most people don't even know that. 2002 wildfires in California, Sigrid Hobson called for help when she saw a wall of flames in from a wildfire coming toward her house. Two deputies drove through walls of flames to save this woman. As they ran up to the house, they saw Sigrid putting a gun to her head. She didn't want to die in the fire. She was just about to shoot herself when they shouted at her to stop. We're here to save you. Stopping her, they got her in to their vehicle and were able to rescue her. When I read that story, isn't that what we do when we go out on the streets? That is what the purpose of Pentecost, if you tingle, great. But I don't care if you never tingle. Witness, because that's what it's for. Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Listen, personal evangelism is the absolute foundation of God's will. It is the cornerstone of our fellowship. In our churches, we have events of all kinds, concerts, plays, uh, every kind of thing. But that's not where the power is. Listen, you're making a mistake if your entire church is event-based. Every month or every two months, you're going to have a big event. You know what happens when you're event-based, then weather hits and wipes it out. There's sickness and no one can perform. Or you ever have outreaches and they suck. Come on, it just didn't go well. <laughs> but listen, if your congregation is filled with fire-empowered witness, when they're going to the gas station, to a restaurant, to school, to work, they're witnessing for Jesus Christ. That is God's plan, Acts 8, 4. Those that were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So Jesus says, get the power, number two, witness. And immediately when he tells them, I want you to notice our text shows the danger of diversions. We have spiritual ADD. We get sidetracked from God's, think about it. All right, guys, this is it, the whole plan Get the power, witness in verse 6. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time to Israel? You're not getting this, are you? It's not to, no, 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 no. You've missed the point. This is what people do. What's the name of the Antichrist? I have no idea. Do you think the Ark of the Covenant is in a cave hidden underneath Golgotha? And the, Who cares? That's a sidetrack. You want to be deep, but Jesus says, witness. And then we come up with ideas that are going to be powerful instead of witnessing. For some, you know, it comes through every few years. Worship, if we're just going to worship and the waves of glory will flow out and sit. The hell's angels will suddenly go. What if we had Christian movie makers in Hollywood? <laughs> and then, of course, social media is going to draw millions. We've learned in the last two months what social media giveth, social media taketh away. <laughs> is that right? Hey, there may be benefit, you can tell me about, there was someone say, while well, you worshiped in a Christian movie and, and so should, great. None of those will ever be as power, uh, powerful as spirit-empowered witnesses. This is what our fellowship was birthed in. The Jesus movement. Some of you, you're, you're, you're much too young. You hear about the Jesus movement. The late 1960s, God sovereignly moved upon the United States. And God began to save hippies, young people who were rebels and involved in sin. You know what the Jesus movement was in its most basic element? The Holy Spirit set young people on fire when they got saved. And they went everywhere witnessing. 
That was the Jesus movement. All across America is there were people that were witnessing. They were passionate about Jesus Christ because they had been set on fire of the Holy Spirit. And we will never outgrow that. We will never come up with a better plan than Jesus Christ already told us. Let's talk finally about spreading fire. Because built into the command of getting the power and being witnesses is the third part of his simple plan, spread the fire. Verse 8, you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. He says, what I give you, you're not meant to hold on to it. Even in a local area, you are meant to give it away. Matthew 10, 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils freely you have received and freely give. In this simple one sentence statement, Jesus gives a masterful strategy of how you can spread the fire. Number one, start locally in Jerusalem. This is where we begin personal relationships. I think uh, uh, Pastor Williams spoke last night. He quoted 78%. I, I read like 75 to 90% of new believers get saved through a friend or an acquaintance. So Jesus says, start where you live. You go to work, you go to school on your streets, start there and evangelize. This is actually the basis of discipleship. Disciples evangelizing and witnessing in the local area. There are disciples, I want to go overseas. Send me to the other side of the United States. You're not even evangelizing locally. Don't tell me about outer Eubangi. You won't even go to morning outreach. So he says, Jerusalem first, your local area. Disciples witnessing Christians witnessing disciples leading outreaches locally. Number two, he says, spread wider. In all Judea, this is the region round about to Jerusalem. Listen, the gospel is meant to be expansionist. It is never meant to be retained only in your church or your area. It is meant to move beyond Luke 4, 43. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also because that's why I was sent. We need to be looking for opportunities for larger expression where there isn't gospel witness. Where is the need? That is our job to find out the need. I looked up cities in America that have the worst drug problems. Here, here are the top cities that have the worst drug problems. Baltimore, Maryland, Chicago, Illinois, Missoula, Montana, Dayton, Ohio, Detroit, Michigan, Louisville, Kentucky, Wilmington, North Carolina, Cincinnati, Ohio. Say they have a, a higher concentration of drugs than anywhere else in America. We need churches there. Where is the gospel not being preached right now? Where do we not have fellowship churches? Philadelphia, over six million people, and I think we have two churches. We are looking, listen, my, my family, dad would announce we're going on vacation. <laughs> vacation. To us, it was great. We're going to swim in a swimming pool in a hotel. But in actual fact, what my father was doing, they were scouting trips. Yeah, we're going to go. We went to Nogales, Arizona for the beauty. It was a scouting trip. He was looking. We didn't have a church there. And while we're, the kids were playing in the pool, trying to drown each other, he's looking. We need a church here because that's what Jesus said, spread wider. Third part of the, God's plan, challenge your prejudice and Samaria. This was shocking to the Jews. These were outcasts, mixed race, 
people not acceptable because Jesus knows the human heart. What, wherever you are, whatever nationality, ethnic background, he knows people that we will tend to focus on people just like us. Our age, our class, our race, we will look for people that we like, that we are, they appeal to us. So Jesus says, start local, spread wider, but challenge your narrowness and your prejudice. That's why Jesus took the disciples to Samaria. He was forcing them to confront their own prejudice and widen their vision. That is healthy. Listen, every church needs this that we confront, that we deliberately cry out, God, give us and seek people that are nothing like us. Let me ask you tonight, who are your Samaritans? Because everybody's got Samaritans. To a Jew, this was just a type of person instinctively they would record. Ooh, I don't know, Jesus. Who are your Samaritans? Is that an age group? Is that a certain type of sin? Is it a race? Who are you not comfortable with? Jesus says, I want you to confront that and to deliberately search for people that are nothing like you. Finally, he says, go to other nations. Here's the fourth part of God's plan and to the end of the earth. Jesus makes clear that our witness is to extend to the whole world. Mark 16, go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature, every person. Matthew 28, make disciples of all nations. In Acts 16, Paul has the vision of the Macedonian man saying, come and help us. And I tell you, the Macedonian man is still calling. The nation of Laos, we planted a church last conference, six million people, we now have one worker there. The nation of Myanmar, used to be Burma, 48 million people, we have not one church there. And then the great cities of the world, Sao Paulo, Brazil, 22 million people, we don't even have a single fellowship church. Delhi, India, 26 million people live in that city and we have one church. According to Jesus Christ, that's not right. We have to do something about that. And when we follow God's plan, get the power, witness, and spread the fire, God blesses because he always blesses his will. I know some of you, you got brilliant ideas, but God blesses his will. Acts 2, 41 through 43, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. That's what God does. When they did what he said, they got the fire. And now Peter stands and he starts the second part to witness. God gets involved. That is what we desperately need in a changing world. I pray that you understand this. When we go home, the devil is trying to make things harder. We need more power. That's the answer. I close with this story. In 1935, a school teacher in Rwanda, Central Africa, his name was Blasio Kugosi. He was deeply discouraged in his own life by the lack of power that he saw in his own life and in his church. So this man, he spent a week praying and fasting in his little cottage, and he emerged a changed man. 
God had convicted him in prayer, so he confessed his sins to people that he had wronged. He proclaimed Jesus Christ in the school where he taught and revival broke out. Many students and teachers wound up being saved. They called these people abaka, meaning people on fire. They invited him to go to Uganda to preach to the church there. He called the leaders to repentance, and as he began to speak, the fire of the Holy Spirit descended in Uganda, just like it had in Rwanda, and with similar results. A few days later, Blasio died of a fever. His ministry only lasted a few weeks, but the revival fire that was triggered in these two nations began to sweep through East Africa, and they say has impact even to this day. Hundreds of thousands of lives were transformed because a man got in touch with the fire of the Holy Spirit. And it all began with a discouraged Christian who set himself apart to seek the fullness of God's Spirit. On the final night, we are about to launch new workers. We have wonderful announcements. But listen, this is not a program. If these people try to go to new cities in their own power, I predict pain. It will not go well. But if we will leave this place and say, God, we have got to have Holy Ghost fire. I believe everywhere we go, I believe that God, some of you came, you're saying, my church, what God, I've been praying, God, light me on fire. If you light me on fire, you'll light the church on fire. This is what we need. I believe if we will follow God's pattern of being witnesses of fire, we can reach the world. How many of you believe that? Thank God. Amen. I want you to bow your heads.